pleasant nights, fellow travelers along the path of the beam. I am known on this level of the tower as I mean Fuego, and if it please you, join me here for a bit of palaver. That's right, on Hail to Stephen King. That's right, the show that I do twice a week, every terrifying Tuesday, every scarific Saturday here on The Horror Show. You can just call me Fuego for short, and I welcome you to The Horror Show, that's right. And uh, yes, this is the second part of coverage that I am doing on basically something that became like Stephen King universe expansion, and originally the film that we are talking about today the Diary of Ellen Rimbauer, which is the adaptation of the real-life journals, I should quotation that, real-life journals of Ellen Rimbauer, um, and just the, the ever-growing, just universe-building and history stuff that is all of the Rose Red mythology. And so this was going to initially be called a film that forgot the face of its father, and I guess to some degree it kind of is, but... Yeah, so long story short, in the last episode, we covered the monstrous miniseries that was Stephen King's Rose Red. It was essentially originally going to be his reinterpretation, much like what the amazing Mike Flanagan did for Netflix this year with uh, Shirley Jackson's source material, The Haunting of Hill House. Um, that was reinterpreted very differently. As was this, it was initially going to be a feature film produced by Spielberg and Amblin Entertainment. Although, you know, just to really quickly breeze through it, uh, Spielberg and King couldn't see eye to eye about whether it was going to be more action-centric or horror-centric. Uh, the feature film was scrapped and it eventually became this 254 minute, I believe it is, yeah, monstrous miniseries on TV that, um, to, to be straight up, is not very good, at least for me. I know a lot of the Hail to Stephen King peeps, especially in the Facebook group, were saying that this is a guilty pleasure of theirs. Well, I'm not going to say that this in particular is a guilty pleasure of theirs, but after reviewing this, watching this just today, but most importantly, reading this, this very important and crucial bit of universe expansion and tie-in promotion, I guess, is where I can officially say, yeah, and this is a bold declaration, that I am as fascinated as Joyce Reardon, the PhD from the imaginary Washington University that leads the expedition that is basically the predominance of what the Rose Red miniseries entails. Yeah, I am as fascinated as her with this just this fake kind of history, I guess, that has been constructed. And yeah, so of the three things that we have that all entail all of this, these three different things, yeah, check them out right there. This is awesome. This is genuinely awesome. Although you're not really gonna enjoy it unless you have the comprehension of you know everything else that's that's going around within it, which is what's so funny about this because once again we're we're talking about these two things today. Um, you can't read this on its own and really get a lot out of it. It is genuinely a a tie-in, uh, you know, just just piece of creation that it it can't stand on its own. It has to be taken in a much larger much larger context. And so the funny thing about that is that. This was released just before Rose Red. Uh, I, I did a lot of internet searching and everywhere just said 2001, 2001. I saw one thing on Amazon where it implied that it came out in, uh, in May, like May 1st, 2000, uh, 2001, excuse me, because the miniseries was January 2002. Um, but yeah, Wikipedia, all kinds of other places that I tried to consult to find out when exactly this was released. Perhaps it was finished in May, but the vibe that I got was that it came out sometime in 2001, but shortly before that late January airing of the Rose Red miniseries. So this is where I guess the waters are ironically murky, but if you read this before, you're probably going to be really, really lost and not going to have that much enjoyment. I mean, it, it does lay groundwork, huh? you know, building a huge house, laying groundwork and stuff like that. but. It's, it's really, if, if you're down with, 
you know, just all of that backstory about the construction of Rose Red, about, you know, the entire, um, you know, Rimbauer clan and everything, and, you know, John's union, his marital union to Ellen, this daughter of a rich, very well-to-do banker, actually. So it's not like she was plucked out of obscurity and, uh, you know, was just this little faceless, you know, no name, you know, uh, you know, you know peon, uh, you know, whatever. She was actually from high society of sorts herself, albeit not, not to the degree of uh, the man to which, you know, she was marrying and stuff. And so this is where I guess I'm just going to give the, the backstory that is in this that you hear all about from Reardon, you know, and she gives, you know, all throughout that miniseries, she gives, you know, breakdown as they're jumping from room to room about, okay, this is where this thing happened that was weird in the house, and this is where this thing weird that's happened that, you know, transpired in the house. And a lot of that aspect about the house being so monstrous and, you know, on the northwest coast and constantly in an aspect of construction because there were these, like, souls almost, like, trapped within it that were speaking to the, uh, the, the matriarch who had taken over for her husband and stuff. Uh, all of that was really pulled and inspired massively from the Winchester Mansion and from, uh, you know, the woman who was the heir to that, that just monstrous fortune. And that's a real place that you can go on tours on. And, um, oh boy, I want to say it's somewhere in Northern California. I can't remember exactly. They just did the Winchester film recently, uh, which I actually thought was pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, so, but, the, you know, uh, inspiration that Psy King, you know, brought in aside, uh, so, so Ellen comes from this family and she's half the age of this guy who wants to marry her, this big, just, uh, oil tycoon in the very early 1900s. So it's the turn of the 20th century. Fossil fuels are really becoming the bee's knees. Like they, they essentially, you know, not taking into consideration anything environmentally that burning all of this stuff and utilizing it for energy is gonna entail. We found out later on, didn't we? And that's not a political statement, but uh, so yeah, I, I mean, cars were becoming a thing slowly but surely. And uh, you know, people were starting to, you know, heat their homes with it and, uh, and you know, all of these different things. And so um, despite the age disparity, Ellen is betrothed and just given away by her family unit because of the fact that this guy is, um, you know, he's very old and very well to do, but, uh, you know, despite being twice her age, 20 versus 40, the one thing that follows him around is this reputation of being a big womanizer and, you know, just never settling down. But isn't that the thing? It's like so many successful men, whether they're entertainers, whether they're, you know, whatever it may be, they sow the wild oats and then eventually they decide, okay, it's time to settle down. I want my legacy to continue. I want, uh, I want an heir to pass my fortune along to. I want my name to continue onward. And that's the thing. It's like, to be very briefly on the real, my last name is Callahan. And uh, you all know me as Fuego, and that is what I've been known as since, boy, almost a decade now, since 2009, when I first started writing for Playtime Magazine, and I was doing music and movies and humor and sports and different things like that. But um, whereas that is a name that is all my own, um, I am a, the, the, the first name is the one, without divulging, that I'm actually technically the fourth Callahan with that first name. And so, yeah, I'm kind of supposed to produce an heir at some point, despite, you know, not being at that point yet. And both of the younger brothers are married and all that other stuff. And I'm still here producing, uh, you know, pursuing, I should say, producing music and art and, you know, uh, journalistic aspirations, all these other things. So it's like, I kind of feel his perspective a little bit, at least as far as that, that particular pressure. I suppose. And so, yeah, he's like, okay, I'm um, finally, this, uh, this is a woman from just very, a, a very proper family. She is, uh, she is debonair. She is, you know, well-versed and trained and smart and articulate. And that was not always the case, especially in like 1908, when a lot of this is initially going down, which is a weird thing that there, you know, since this was apparently coming out first, just barely, and there's certain 
there's certain years and facts that don't match up with both of these. It's really just smaller trivial things, but that'll definitely be, <coughs> excuse me, one of my gripes, you know, at the end of the day when it comes to the thing that came first. And, you know, despite saying right here, basically this played up the fact that this was the, the real deal, okay? They produced an ABC miniseries, as I mentioned during the part one video, uh, you know, not even the miniseries, I should say. It was a ABC special ahead of the miniseries. It even had an interview with Stephen King where they were implying that this was a real journal, you know, and this was before the whole, and I guess right at the onset of the whole, you know, real hauntings and how, you know, there would be so many of these new specials on the major networks and, you know, in turn on A&E and even perhaps uh, like a PBS or, you know, whatever. Although I must say this feels more like a, a lifetime special in a lot of ways. But yeah, so um, they presented this as fact. You know, albeit with a little like nod and wink kind of thing, but they did. They presented it as fact. They had Stephen King in the ABC 30 Minute special talking about how he was writing a dramatization more or less based on true events that, you know, captivated him. So they really went to very interestingly extreme lengths, uh, apparently inspired by the way the Blair Witch Project presented their marketing in the fact that they, they made it seem, they implied that this was all real and the Psy King camp and all of those people behind him whispering and so on and so forth. Who knows how much of it was his driving force and how much was not just ABC, but all of his producing partners, you know, managers and everyone else around him at that particular point, especially where King had kind of lost some steam by the turn of the century, the, the turn of the millennium, I should say. And, um, I don't know, maybe this was an effort from his people. They're like, you know, look, you've, you've hurt yourself recently. You know, you said you weren't going to write anymore, all these different things. And this all happened like around that same time. And so I, maybe they jumped on a trend. I'm not necessarily going to be one to point that out. But once again, back to what captivates me so much is this fake mythology that they put together and presented as fact. And so this 40 something marries the 20 something and uh, he's constructing this massive place that is apparently being built on Indian burial ground. They found bodies, well, you know, the remnants of bodies. They found bones and they found artifacts and all these different things. And they apparently, you know, were like, nope, nope, let's just burn them and, you know, sprinkle some crap on them, get out of here. Nah, you know, that's, they, they showed no respect and they just disregarded the sanctity. And they're like, well, we're already this far into the process. It's not like we're just gonna stop and move on to different land. We purchased the land. We've done so much groundwork already. And that's a trope. Yeah, but it's one that's understandable in the Pacific Northwest and everything. And so I, I'm not justifying it, but it, it, it works to some degree, I guess, especially when you get into some of the later things once the house has been actually finished and whatnot. So I, I must say that there is a, uh, there is a real author whose name is eluding me, Ridley Pearson. And so a lot of people, when this book was initially put out right around the same time of the miniseries, or excuse me, of, yeah, yeah, of the, of the miniseries, they were like, did Stephen King actually write this? It doesn't feel like his type of writing. It's very, it's, it's purple as one reviewer described it. It's, it's very like, uh, t t historical fiction, you know, kind of colloquial kind of, I don't know how you would properly describe it, but it's, it's dry, but I, I honestly really like Pearson's writing in this because it is a, it is a diary and it's written from the first person perspective of Ellen and she's given some slightly sinister qualities in this that I don't necessarily think the prequel adaptation or the miniseries actually properly get across. She has she has a fascination with the the opposite side of the other world, you know, and the afterlife and things like that. And in within the first like few pages, she's she gets upset about something and she's praying to the like darker Lord. She's praying the forces that are not the Christian God that she was raised to believe in and revere. And it just grows from there in the fact that, you know, after she goes on this lengthy honeymoon while they're finishing constructing this home on Indian burial ground, despite the fact that there is somebody who kills another worker on the day dude decides to propose, which is actually something they do not do properly in this. They, 
they make John uh, Rimbauer not seem quite as bad because in the source material, um, the person gets killed and then he still goes forward with his plans to, you know, uh, propose marriage in the in the little short miniseries ABC prequel adaptation. It happens as he's proposing, so it doesn't make it seem quite as bad. Whereas in this, it's just like, yeah, he is a, he is a man with a plan, and he's not going to let any of what he is calculatedly piecing together be pushed aside in any way, shape, or form. And so, but so uh, yeah, he goes on this like honeymoon journey with her, and they go all over the world. They go and they go to the uh, you know tropic islands. They go. To, they go to Kenya and Africa, and they're on safari, and then they end up in Cairo, and they you know, they go to all these different places in Europe and whatnot. And it's just, it's funny because of the fact that they they talk about, um, oh boy, I want to say, is it Sigmund Freud? Whose name I can't, I can't really remember. He's in, he was basically the, the French dude who was writing about not just sexual awakening, but like the, the strange appetites that people are unwilling to just make mention of and this book is fairly lurid at times um ellen's kind of a closet freak and as it's coming out especially in the first like hundred or so pages when you're first like realizing it as she's realizing it like she's checking out the girls herself she's you know saying how much she likes the kinky shizzle that john is into even if she hates him sometimes she still has the carnal desires other times and it just it makes her character so much more in-depth, so much more three-dimensional, so much more fascinating, and so much, so much less vanilla than she is especially presented in this. Um, except for one particular scene where there's, well, they basically, they spell it out. They're, yeah, there's a three-way with one of the chicks in, in Kenya. And uh, anyway, so, you know, they, they return from, you know, these world travels that last like a year, after initially being married, they return to this enormous home. And that's another thing that I have to say, this novel, it's short, it's like 250 pages. And I mean, there's, there's pictures, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's photographs, there's crude drawings. It's really, it's very much like a journal, like a scrapbook kind of thing, which is dope. Uh, despite the fact that they imply it's pieced together by Joyce Reardon after a bunch of stuff was discovered at an estate sale. But so, uh, you really get the scope of this mansion in the book. When they're talking about how she never goes over to the East Wing because it's so huge. When they talk about the extent of how vast each of their personal quarters are, John and Ellen respectively. When they talk about the extravagance of this first ball in January that's celebrating their move into the house and it's going to be an annual thing and they talk about, you know, the hundreds of people there and they talk about the scope of the ballroom and they talk about all the people seated at the grand banquet hall for the feast and stuff. You don't get that scope across in this adaptation because you just can't. It's television for God's sake. And we're not talking like modern television that is, you know, I don't know, HBO or the streaming networks or whatever, where, where television is being taken in a much different light and being given much higher budgets and stuff, it's very contained. And uh, that in turn constrains some things. But without really spoiling too much more, the burial ground aspect comes into play heavily, especially for the sheer fact that the predominance of those buried there were male warrior natives. And there's a reason why men are killed and why women disappear that is explained in a very fascinating fashion here in the diary source material specifically that's never really touched upon in either the rose red mini series that king penned himself or the uh the little feature filmy kind of thing which they it's listed as a mini series on the wiki and the imdb but it says right here that it's R-rated for some sexual content. I don't know how that could be the case. It originally aired on ABC. But it is kind of cool that a, a little over a year later, they brought back um, Craig R. Baxley, who was the one who directed this. They brought back the same guy to edit it, Sonny Baskin. Uh, they brought back, I believe, the same guy to do the music. Yep, Gary Chang. And so it has that, it has that continuity, which is kind of cool. The only thing is they... There's flashback scenes in the Rose Red miniseries, the you know the first piece of content that we got on the screen for this uh, for this world building, and um, 
they recast both John and Ellen, which is kind of a bummer because they, they both looked okay and serviceable. But the one thing that I am extremely, extremely happy that they decided to retain was uh, that Sidai, uh, Saidi Leloka, I'm, I, I butchered that name horrendously and I, I massively, massively apologize. But she is the one who plays the, uh, as I just double checked, that she's, uh, no, she's not even, she's not even listening in the back credits. But that is the woman who plays the, the it's almost like a, a handmaiden assistant of sorts that, um, you know, Ellen takes on after the trip to Africa, the one that nurses her back to health after malaria, and I want to say it's a, a, a Sakina. I just want to double check because I, uh, yes, Sakina, I remembered correctly. So um, they bring the same actress back from the miniseries to actually play her in the diary of Ellen Rimbauer. Uh, the problem with this is especially how richly descriptive so much of this is about the, the, the motivations, the conflictions of Ellen's character and how much more fascinating I find her because of that, um, this really feels like it is in super fast forward mode. Whereas this is plotting and boring with everything, you know, that is taking place. Like the parts of this that I like the most, as I said in my previous review, were where we were actually jumping back in time and learning more about everything that happened with the Rimbauer clan and, you know, Ellen and you know all the stuff with disappearances of people including family members and the death of others and whatnot and how the place you know once again like I said kills men and then just chooses women to like disappear and become a part of it and there is a correlation with the the husband's infidelity John's you know uh, wandering eyes and the specific women that do disappear without really you know divulging anything and confirming anything but uh, yeah, whereas this is too long and plotting and boring, especially all the stuff with the paranormal investigators when we're not doing flashbacks, this is too short, especially being based on this, and this is only like a little 200 and some change. I mean, yeah, this, it's funny how it softens the blow on some things, and yet it makes other things a little bit harsher, including, you know, one of the maid's fate and what presumably happens to her. Uh, and, you know, there's also, you know, that little bit of year change by like, you know, one or two, and then just, uh, there's also a couple character interactions that are really not properly developed that you would suspect based on, you know, the way certain things are written and a few things that develop. But also when Ellen starts consulting mediums and all this other stuff, like, you can tell she is down with the other world in the source material, which would be this, and yet, they, they make her seem much more wide-eyed and naive and, like I said earlier, vanilla. But at the end of the day, if you like Rose Red, but specifically, all of the stuff that happened in the past with regards to Rose Red, with regards to, you know, Ellen, with regards to the constant construction, with regards to, I mean, geez, everything that helps make this story actually intriguing for me, that is where, okay, you have me here. And that is why I, I just cannot recommend enough tracking down, it's not the most, okay, you have to get through these to get to this and to really properly appreciate this. But despite the fact that this was not written by Psy King, I really, really like this. And it borders on, I don't know if I would go as far as love, but deep, deep fascination. And, I mean, hell, they even have a fake afterword by Steven Rimbauer in this, you know, who's the great-grandson. And they, they went to some serious lengths with this to really make it all seem believable. And it's, it's a pity that both of these kind of fall flat for me because this is awesome. It really is. It's cool. And, uh, but, you know, words of warning, again, you're not going to like this as a standalone. Another thing that kind of sucks is that as somebody brought to my attention, both of these are expensive, out of print, hard to track down. Um, I know you can get the used paperback of this for a decent price. I was just looking on Amazon right before filming this, but if you want the hardcover, I know the I know the used runs you around twenty something bucks, and for something not even written by Cy King and only two hundred something pages, I don't know. I mean, King was charging like. 
20 for the elevation little thing, which has nowhere near as much reading and stuff to dive into as this. But um, this is really only for the diehard King fans. But I must say, if you're one of those people who considers this a guilty pleasure and you like Rose Red, you gotta, you gotta maybe search the torrents or whatever for this, unless you really want to shell out some cash. And um, yeah, same with this. Try to like scour your your savers, your your local resale bookstores, places like that. Here in Arizona, we thankfully have Bookman's and Zia and a few other places. I know half price books is a good source. Research eBay and the Amazon sellers specifically if you have interest in getting just a lot more backstory. And honestly. This being a little bit different from both of these, in a lot of ways it makes sense because this is supposed to be the genuine source material and this is supposed to be an inspired by true events adaptation and all too often don't these take like creative liberties just a little bit? So that's the one saving grace that I can say, okay, these are a little bit different than this, but it's okay and it's forgivable because, you know, the, the whole based on a true story, true events, whatever, it doesn't always completely clearly correlate. So I want to extend a grande gracias to everybody who listened to me ramble about this little known in many like major circles Stephen King property that, that uh, this is a film that forgot the face of its father for the sheer fact that I don't even know if it ever knew its father. It's, it's weird in that degree, but I still enjoyed it. It's not trash. It's not bad. You know, it's, it's like a good a &E or Lifetime or something historical drama, but I know Cecil hating period pieces. He probably would not be particularly down with it. Now, as we only have a couple episodes left in 2018 before we approach the year of 2019, which is going to be massive for Hail to Stephen King and for fans, the, the first episode of the year, which is going to be on January 1st, is actually going to be all about previewing the year of 19, all of the King projects, re-releases, adaptations that are coming out. That's going to be a lot of fun. On the second to last episode of the year, we are going to be discussing the stand in the December spoiler review for the Hail to Stephen King book club because we always choose, oh, well, I choose a book and then I'm like, hey, if you guys have read it or want to read it, check it out. We're going to be doing a live YouTube, uh, just kind of hangout sort of thing, all spoiler related, all about the stand and its various incarnations in the comic and, you know, the film adaptation and maybe even talking a little bit about the still whispered about, uh, you know, bit that Josh Boone is supposedly working on for the CBS All Access service. So that's going to be a ton of fun. And in the year of 2019, with the exception of everything else that I have planned from anniversary coverage to all kinds of other cool things, I am going to be doing the few other Psy King things that he wrote specifically for screen. Um, one more is going to be an adaptation, which is the Kingdom Hospital, which is celebrating an anniversary, I believe a 15 year anniversary. And I'm also going to be doing that other journal thing that they took the same approaches with this. And I think that was also ABC. So that's kind of funny. But we're also going to be discussing a anniversary review of Storm of the Century that, if I'm not mistaken, is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, which is a ton of fun. I love Storm of the Century. Didn't love it as a kid, but rewatching it as an adult, it's fantastic. And it really started this renaissance kind of period in King's career of wanting to write stuff specifically for screen. He had done it once before with the golden years for CBS. And I'm also going to be doing a review of that where you learn all this backstory about the shop, which you know from, uh, oh boy, they're in the mist and they're most notably in Firestarter. So that's also going to be fun. And uh, yeah, so lots of coolness to look forward to in the year of 19. So I've been Jaime Fuego. You can find me on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and the YouTubes. My Patreon for Jaime Fuego is launching very soon. You can check my social media where I will be discussing that in depth. And if you want me to cover things specifically beyond horror or exclusive access to me, just you know, doing things besides the scarific, that's going to be an option, but there's also going to be more fresh stuff coming on my personal YouTube channel, getting the green screen, some other coolness, very excited about that. More importantly than even that though, is subscribing here to the horror show. If you are just stumbling upon this video for some particular reason, we do two, sometimes three episodes a day, but Cecil and I are in very heavy discussion as the you know, two producers along with Dave of this show. And, you know, we also have some awesome assistance from Andrew Mercer and, uh, you know, Marsha Parker. But, uh, yeah, we, we are really thinking that for the year of 19, 
that perhaps we're just flooding the market a little bit by doing two, sometimes three episodes a day. Now, having a timely trailer reaction or something like that, that can always be something completely different. But we're thinking, you know, we'll give you guys one regular dose of the horror show every day of the week, and then we just give you, you know, if you want to be a patron and you want additional content, you know, it'll be there for you, and if not, we won't be clogging up your notifications. You know, we will only leave all of those additional bits of content for the people who really, really want it and want to see everything that we do because I know so many of us are subscribed to so many different channels on YouTube, it's nearly impossible to watch everything you want on YouTube and then everything new that's popping up on the streaming services and then still go to the movies and still watch whatever TV shows are coming out and still read for God's sake and still spend time with your family and friends for God's sake and still socialize on the social medias, whatever. Yeah, it's one fuck of a juggling act. And so um, if you're better at juggling or have less things that are a priority to keep up in the air, yeah, maybe that'll work better for patrons. And so that's what we are thinking, but nothing has been confirmed. So what are your thoughts? Give us those below, as well as everything that you have thought about this particular episode. It is greatly appreciated. And if you want further palaver, jump on the Facebook group called Hail to Stephen King. Um, I have so much love, adoration, and respect, and appreciation for everybody that frequents that just awesome quartet every single day. So until the next episode comes around of Hail the Stephen King, hasta luego, sin amigos. I am hopeful that we get to reconnect sooner rather than later. Say thank you. And remember, stay scared. And read Stephen King, or in this case, um, the guy who used all of his notes to put something together.